How can you identify linguistic presuppositions whenever somebody is disagreeing with you or can't change in a session if you're a coach and you try in vain to make them realize how they can change, but they don't. That is in many cases because you haven't read correctly the linguistic presuppositions that were hidden in their dialogue from the get-go. And in this video, you will learn three simple steps to identify those and be able, become able to influence anyone in the blink of an eye with those skills right away. Or maybe not right away, depending on how fast you can go, but it is definitely going to improve your skills. Basically, I wanted to address this comment that asked the questions about linguistic presuppositions. And mostly what I want to address here is for the book Coaching Excellence. I did not read that, but I checked slightly. It seems like a great book. Definitely check that out if you are into coaching and wanting to help others. And what I really focus on here is gathering a lot of information information as well as understand the solution right away when, they when the client first say anything and decoding the deepest possible meaning from a single opening sentence from a client. Definitely the most biggest sticking point that many beginners into NLP and hypnosis are struggling with. So we are going to dissect that in three different steps that I know will be quite helpful for you. The very first one and the way it was taught in the early NLP training by the people who who actually knew what they were talking about, was to differentiate a presupposition from an interpretation or a mind reading. When you think you know something about somebody versus something that is clearly implied by their statement. And that may not be that easy to differentiate. One of the easiest exercises we used to give back in the day was can you read that phrase? For example, I am not sure whether or not I should stop beating my dog. Pretty weird phrase, and you have a series of choice of choices. Which one is a presupposition and which one is an interpretation? Presuppositions here is, okay, he has a dog. Yes, semantically, linguistically, that is definitely contained in the, in the phrase because there is my dog. So the presupposition he has a dog is verified. However, he loves his dog. Well, that may or may not be the case. That is an interpretation. It is not presupposed. It is eventually linked. But so far, it is not validated at all. He currently beats his dog. Yes, that is validated because it is implied in the sentence. He's a low-life slob who should be shot. It is not a presupposition. It is a judgment made by the person who might be hearing that. When you can differentiate between what you judge out of somebody, what you project, what you interpret, and what is really said, you have made the first step into sharpening you, your ear to figure out what is hidden behind their statement that I need to go fish for and distance myself from the judgments I may have about that person that are not validated at all, linguistically speaking. That way you save time because if you confront somebody on your judgments, it's going to uh, break, going to fight between a map of the world and a map of the world that go in contradiction, that is never going to end. But if you only follow the trail of real presuppositions, like he has a dog, he's beating his dog, okay, we stay here and from there we elaborate, why do you beat your dog, when did you start? there we are going somewhere relevant. If we go into judgment and interpretation, we are leading nowhere. Another example, I don't see why I can't do it. All my friends are doing it. Whatever the activity is, we have this phrase alone. And you have from that phrase alone, which might be said in the beginning of a session, to elaborate, to figure out which presuppositions are relevant to track to figure out and which ones are, comp are not, not presuppositions from that list. So this person feels that, they, uh, that he or she is being treated unfairly. May or may not be the case because unfairly hasn't been clearly said in that phrase. So unfairly is again a judgment being it's, it is fair, it is not fair. It is a judgment that may or may not be relevant here, but the person did not use the word unfairly. So that is an interpretation here, even if that may be the case, but that is still an interpretation because we haven't validated yet that this was the case. He wants to be liked by his friends. Complete bullshit. Nothing of that phrase is presupposing that. It is just an interpretation. 
this person's friends are doing something he's not doing himself. Yes, that is validated. All my friends are doing it. That is a real presupposition. All his friends are bums uh, who should be shot. Again, a judgment. Maybe their friends are doing drugs and the mom, mother doesn't want his, her son to do drugs. But in that case, judging the friends for being a low-life, useless idiots, that would be a judgment that this is not real. And many of you watching this right now, you are making judgments all day long without realizing it. You don't understand people, you judge based on your interpretation. And that is where the big mismatch is that create all the, co the verbal conflicts in the world. So next step two, now we, that we have understood what a presupposition really is and is not, we want to figure out from all the possible presuppositions into one sentence, which one is the one we want to pursue, which one is the most relevant, and which ones do we have to let go of because they are not really important in that context. And that is the, the other point where people get lost because then they start having more sh sharper ear, they start hearing about belief here, belief there, but they don't really know where should I go with that person because the client is talking about a million things. I'm not really sure what I should do. That is the next step. It is based on which outcome you have for the person. And if it is a coaching session, most likely you will not define the outcome. The client will define his or her outcome by themselves. You may help them to clarify something they want, but they are the one choosing what they want, not you. Not in coaching though, at least. Maybe in other circumstances, eventually. In coaching, no, the client has to choose. Once the outcome is clear, once clearly the client knows what they want and you have maybe help, uh, been helping them uh, putting words on what they want, they want to become a better athlete, for example. Then, okay, which most problematic presupposition is contained in their sentence that proves that they won't become a top-level athlete? Which one do we have to follow so that it unlocks their potential to become a top-level athlete? if that is their outcome. So the definition, the decision of which presupposition is the most relevant one is only based on the outcome we have for this conversation. Depending on what the conversation uh, is about, we can decide which presuppositions to attack, reframing, and which ones to, okay, even if you disagree, fine. Just give that away, whatever. You may disagree, but it is not the point, okay? They believe in God, you don't. Or, you don't, or they don't believe in God, you do, you know, fine, it is not the point at all. So let's just get that away, get away from that, we don't care. Stay on the relevant presupposition. Example, every hypnotist is evil. Okay, that is a pretty, that, that is an attack, that is a judgment. Then if I was getting attacked by this, my first outcome would be to make the person envision that hypnosis can also be positive depending on the context and depending on who is doing it. I want, that is my outcome. I want the person to validate that hypnosis can also be positive without dismissing there has been abuse in the past, uh, in history, although I do believe there can be positive uses. I want to convince that person. Therefore, the main presupposition I want to attack, I want to challenge in this statement is the presupposition that this person has already met other hypnotists and maybe it went really bad. And I will challenge therefore, who did you meet who was doing hypnosis? And if the person is telling me, oh, nobody but my cousin or my sister or my some friend I saw someday uh, said it was bad, uh, then you don't really have any evidence. And from there, it's going to be really easy to reframe. If the person has had an experience with hypnosis that went bad, okay, what happened? I want to clarify. And from there, I can reframe very easily because I take care of the real belief of the person based on their real experience. I don't stay in the realm of uh, philosophical debates of, yeah, it should be right, it should not be right, according to Kant, Kant according to Nietzsche, Nietzsche whatever. Oh, 
stay grounded into reality what is evidence based on the person you are talking to what are their presuppositions revealing another example i can never stop smoking completely okay there if it is in a coaching session that person obviously wants to stop smoking and i want to challenge the presupposition that this person has tried to stop before i want to figure out what happened when you tried and how do you know this uh, those little attempts you've had so far are legit evidence that you will never be able to stop. I want to challenge the only presuppositions uh, matter that matters here. They have tried before, it did not work. Why? What happened? From there, I have a good outcome in mind. Next example, if my book doesn't sell well, there is no hope anymore. Okay, what I'm hearing right now, what I hear if somebody says that, is that person is placing expectations on the result that are abnormal because I have met authors who didn't really care because they kept publishing new novels like every six months they didn't really care so if the publication of that new book uh, for that person is that relevant I want to figure out what kind of expectations are linked with the result of the uh, this book and which expectations are linked because if it is just financial, well, you have many ways to make money. So why should it be about this only? And if it is about um, the value of the person, but if my book doesn't sell well, I'm a piece of shit. Okay, we have live, we have self-esteem expectations on a tangible object, which is kind of dissonant to me. But I want to challenge that. Based on the context, based on what the person is saying, there is always one presupposition more relevant than the others. Listen for the entire context, listen for the outcome, and based on the outcome of that person, challenge the blocking sticking point that are preventing that person from moving forward. Always think about hidden benefits. What does that person is get? What is that person gaining out of not succeeding? What is that person gaining out of being a failure? Out of uh, uh, what kind of things do they want to prove, and unco even unconsciously, by not succeeding or by proving you wrong? If they try to prove you wrong. What are they gaining out of proving you wrong? Maybe they want to, they want to show that they have been betrayed or um, molested as a child and you not taking care of them is a proof that nobody will ever take care of them because they are trying to unveil their trauma. But since there are defenses causing limiting beliefs and limiting beliefs are uncovered by the linguistic presuppositions, they may just be on the defensive. If you take that as an attack, you will never uncover uh, what they were trying to hide. But if you take some distance and challenge their presuppositions, oh, okay, so I am not listening to you. How am I not listening to you right now? Then you are making them unload, unveil the potential trauma here. If the person has never been taken care of, challenging the fact that yes, you are listening. So no, there, there are people who take care of you. It's just you don't let them taking care of you maybe. In that case, the person will slowly start to unveil the tense thing. And there you are leading to the painful aspect they were trying to hide, which was why there were uh, limiting beliefs, defense mechanisms. And by following the trail of presuppositions, you can go back at the root cause. Why do they felt? Be why did they feel betrayed, or why did they feel um, abandoned or neglected? For example, then we can act upon something really important. The person's self-esteem, for example, that is very relevant. But arguing over abstract, abstract concepts, you, you're going to spend five hours on that and leading to nothing. So better target the biggest um, difficult uh, unprocessed emotions the person is trying to hide. And finally, step number three, it is going to be to use the cause and effect structure from the meta model, which is getting a bit more advanced because it presupposes, therefore, that at this point you have been able to uncover all the presuppositions that somebody may have had. And you have, you can distend, you can cut down in your head, you can separate the cause and the effect. Because this happened, now they feel bad. Because my wife left me, now I'm a piece of shit. Because I can't stop cigarette, because I could not stop cigarette in the past, I will never be able to do so. 
cause effect, cause effect. Any kind of belief can be attached to something that happened or to an evidence, some sort of evidence, X equals Y, A equals B. Any kind of evidence can lead to any kind of feeling. When the person has a judgment, this is the right thing to do, this is impossible, this should be done like that, I can't. How did you know you could not? How did you know it? How do you know it is the right thing to do? How do you know this is wrong? How do you know men should do this or women shouldn't do that? What is the evidence? Once you have the evidence, you have the cause and the effect. With the cause and an effect, we can work. We can start the reframing and the potentially healing process. Once we have that, we simply challenge by how can this mean that? Which is one of the foundations of the MED model. Uh, I won't go in details about this right here because it's going to take two hours, but the how can this mean that on the top is the base, one of, I guess, the most effective technique from the meta model because you are really getting back at the roots of how their belief was formed. You can reframe in other ways if you want, but the how can this mean that is maybe the most direct way of uh, getting the person to change their perspective about any limitation because it is pinpointing, it is highlighting the lack of objectivity into their statement. When you ask them how can this mean that, you are pointing out that what they believe in is only subjective. It is not reality, it is their interpretation of reality. An example I had recently in a session that with somebody who will recognize himself hearing that, he said, um, I'm going to rephrase for simplicity, he, he, he said, um, I can't become fluent with women when I approach them, or I can't, uh, I can't really be assertive uh, when I approach women in the street because I don't know what to say. The way I challenged that was by asking, how can you be so sure that knowing what to say ahead of time, the cause, how can you be so sure that knowing what to say ahead of time is the only way to become assertive with women? Because my belief was that you can develop those skills, that, is, that kind of um, assertiveness that can be developed. His mind at this point was fixated at least on this call, onto I need to know what to say first before I can be assertive. And my point was, well, you can develop the, the intuition of what to say by practicing, by approaching, and you don't have to wait to know what to say before approaching. So I challenged with how can this mean that? How can you be so sure that knowing what to say ahead of time is the only way to create the effect being assertive with women? And that was confusing at first. And then he gathered up uh, thoughts, uh, ideas, enumerations. Later he figured out uh, new solutions. In the beginning you challenge beliefs like that by challenging the cause and effect structure. How do you know this equals that? How can you know this is the only possible outcome for that? Slowly but surely you are getting people to open their mind to new solutions, new possibilities that they had maybe never uncovered before. If you want to keep digging into this topic and figuring out how presuppositions work and how can you challenge people's beliefs without being confrontational and while helping them to get more resources, to get more resourceful and to um, build more self-esteem, maybe build more self-confidence, you have a document down below called The Seven Steps to Master Slide of Mouth. It will be of great help if you you want to develop your communication skills so that you can help people in turn to develop more beliefs about their assertiveness, about their confidence, and help them figuring out that whenever they think they are stuck, there is actually another option they had not considered before. You have this document down below, read it if you want, you will be my guest, and in any case, I will see you again in another video. Thank you for watching or listening. Good luck with your day, whatever you're doing right now, and see you soon.